A couple of things about me to kind of explain who I am and what I'm doing here. I am not a Wooca I'm not a developer, and I don't have a WooCommerce store. I'm sorry, I'm, nothing against it, it's just that's not what I have. Um, I am a Senior Director of E-Commerce Growth Services, which is a delightfully vague title, which means all of the things e-commerce, but my background is traditionally paid search. So for the last 11, almost 12 years, all I've done is sell people things online. So I do the other half of it. I bring them to the site, and hopefully they check out with WooCommerce. Uh, what I do also have, that I hope, to offer you today is a diverse range of experience. So the smallest product catalog I've ever worked with was two products, and the biggest was 800000 I've spent 50 bucks a month, and I spent $1.2 million a month. So it's kind of all over the place. I've worked with different feed vendors. I've worked with different carts. I've worked with different... Uh, Websites in general, I've tried to bribe developers with various bottles of booze, whatever it takes <laughs> to get stuff online, right? So hopefully uh, I can help fill some gaps uh, outside of the, the WooCommerce universe. Uh, additionally, I do this a lot. I speak at a lot of paid search conferences, and when I was given the opportunity to come here, I jumped on it because, one, I wanted to learn more about WooCommerce because I also have a small business myself. I sell uh, Christmas ornaments. Not anymore. I had a kid. She got in the way. Um, but I sell Christmas ornaments, and I used, uh, I have a, Word, it's a WordPress site, Bluehost hosting, and I was using uh, the plugin Goldcart, and I think I hate it. Um, and so when I started researching for WooCommerce, I realized I really need to come here, and I need to actually attend this and probably talk to all these vendors downstairs and figure out how I can uh, get in on this. Because I saw the, the keynote this morning, and I'm, like, I'm missing out. So, yes, Christmas ornaments, uh, but like I said, I don't do them so much anymore because I have two fur children and one regular, and they are very busy all the time. So, very busy. She's 20 months old, which means she's into everything, which means mom doesn't make Christmas ornaments right now. Right now, mom just picks up things. Everything is picking up things. And when anybody ever asks how she's doing, I always just say she persists, and the reason is because if you have a toddler, all they try to do is kill themselves, like constantly. Just every other stairs, I mean, she found all of the things, all the knives, all the bottle openers, all the scissors. I don't know how, I mean, she found stuff, I don't even know where it went. But where I came from, so to give a little bit more context, is Commerce Hub. So Commerce Hub is not a company you probably have heard of, or maybe you have, but we do dropship fulfillment as our core capability, but we do it primarily for like enterprise retailers. So think like, uh, let's see, what am I allowed to say? QVC is one, and uh, Kohl's, I think, is on our website. So we touch, we do a lot of order management. Uh, so order comes in, our network of 65 retailers, we connect them to 10,000 suppliers throughout the United, United States, UK, and Canada. So what we're supposed to say is one single connection to connect all sources of demand and delivery. So I work on the demand side, which is the Google, the Bing, the Facebook, and then the marketplaces in particular. So Amazon, eBay, Jet. Walmart and Newegg. Now, I'm not a marketplace expert, but I'm learning about it. And the reason is because of marketplace advertising, more than anything else. Today, I focus the talk primarily on paid search, the classic definition, the Google, the Bing, the Facebook search engines. But I also wanted to make sure, because I researched this conference. You guys don't live blog a lot, so it was really hard to figure out what you like or what you might not like. And then also um, developers. So I know some are and some aren't, so I wasn't really sure what you would find interesting or funny. But I, as I understand, my, my, my goal was to hit it right down the middle. So not so high level that I'm explaining to you what a Google is and how the AdWords auction works, but not so in the weeds that uh, I lose you and all you're doing is looking at your watch going, you know, you're the only thing standing between me and lunch. So fully recognize that I'm supposed to stop by 1220 so that you can go to lunch. All right, so first and foremost, I wanted to start our story with this. It depends. And I'm sure that you use this phrase quite a bit in, in your day-to-day -day as well. But whenever somebody comes up and has a question about paid search, the answer is always, it depends. Because it really depends on where you're coming from. What category are you in? Who are your competitors? What's your budget? What do you think your, well, what do you think your budget should be versus what it actually is? Uh, what do you want to sell versus what is actually selling? Um, and you know, I actually went to the, uh, the mixer last night, and I had somebody, um, I I'm not sure if he's a speaker or not, but he came up and he goes, Elizabeth, first he complained about the bacon wrapped around the fig because he's from Texas and he doesn't think that bacon should be around fruit. So we had a discussion about that. I said, you're lucky it's is Seattle. That could not be real. That might not be real bacon. That could be soy. But it's not Portland. All right. So 
he says, what are you going to do if somebody comes up and says, AdWords sucks. Google sucks. I tried it. It doesn't work. And the answer is, well, it could be right. I don't work for Google. Sometimes it sucks. Depending on what you're doing and what your goals are, it might not be good for what you're trying to do. The cost per click might be too high. Uh, the, 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 the quality of the conversions they bring you or not quality of conversions they bring you might not be good enough or to sustain the effort. Absolutely. So one of the things that I'm trying to do through this presentation is give you kind of rules and thumb, rules of thumb and guidelines through my last 11 years or my, last, my journey through to kind of give you a ballpark of where you can start answering the question after, well, it depends. So first and foremost, let's set some expectations. So when it comes to paid search budgets, like I said, I got them as low as 10 bucks a month to as much as a million dollars a month. And it, it really, it, does, it always depends on how much you're willing to spend, but also what you want to set as a realistic expectation. So I always say, whatever number you pick, assume it's gone. So it's like a game, this is how I play craps. I don't have a gaming problem, I swear. Um, but I do, I am sorry, let me get off the, the Wi-Fi. Um, apparently, I should have disconnected from the internet. OK. So basically, turn it off. Off, there we go. Sorry about that. Good to know. They're fine. <laughs> so know that it can be gone, right? So if you walk up to a crafts table and you have about an about a, a, a amount of money that you're going to spend, you're going to put it on the table, and then once in a while, it's all gone. And then you're left with the decision. Do I keep putting more money on the table, or do I walk away? You should walk away at that point. Usually, that, ta that means the table's cold and you're kind of done. So don't, don't put more money in until you've stopped and reassessed. Maybe you need to change casinos. Maybe you need to change your gameplay. But either way, I always say when it comes to paid search and you first start out, just assume that it's going to be gone. Now, however, let's say that you are starting to make some money on it. So what would be a good idea for a goal? So I say rule of thumb, three to one return on ad spend when it comes to text keyword ads is probably pretty decent. If you can get two, you can get three. Some people get, can get more aggressive. But on average, that's a pretty good goal to shoot for. And then when it comes to product listing ads, be a little bit more aggressive. I've seen it go up to eight to one, but that's not necessarily everybody or realistic. So again, five to one, you can get a little bit better. And then when you come into competition, right? So just because you sell blue widgets and somebody else sells blue widgets doesn't necessarily make you a competitor, right? Technically, Amazon is all our competitor. But I'm pretty sure they don't consider us all competitors. Uh, and then average CPC. So I have seen the CPC be as low as 10 cents. And on average these days, it's more like 30 cents, like on a product listing ad, depending on what it is. But I've also seen clicks as high as $400. It's insane. The highest, the highest keyword click I ever saw, it was not e-commerce, by the way. It was all lead gen. Um, second DUI attorney, Los Angeles. So, and here's the trick with that one. If you're gonna make your $400 worth it, you don't run that keyword all the time at, this, at the same budget. You have to know when people are looking for that keyword, right? So when are people gonna search for a second DUI attorney? Monday morning, Sunday morning, and it's probably their significant other, right? Um, New Year's Day. Friday morning, yeah, New Year's Day, that's a good one. But it just, it, that kinda goes to the know your audience, right? So additionally on the budgets, this kind of helps. So choosing a budget that fits your, fits your goals, but also channels. So Google will provide you with the most volume when it comes to search engines, you know, go figure, especially with e-commerce. They have multiple ad types. And so, like I said, I didn't go through this uh, presentation and I want to put a bunch of stuff in that was Googleable. Like you can Google, Google like AdWords ad types. Um, but they have every, like text ads, product listing ads, video, display, uh, uh, sponsored links and Gmail these days. So you have to decide what will be best for you. Gmail ads, I've never seen do really good on a direct return. I've seen them do really well for newsletter signups or coupons. I have not seen them do really well for buying stuff. Um, they have more robust scheduling. So if you're that DUI attorney, maybe you can, uh, you can get a more flexible schedule there. Like I said, lots of control. They have an offline editor, customer support. They have a very active community. So if you ever have a question or uh, a problem, you can join the help community. We call it, we jokingly call it in the industry, uh, the help center that Google doesn't pay for. So it's all these folks that have, you know, they're very, and they're very rabid. Like they have their badges, they answer as many questions as they can. They're extremely detailed, some of them. 
so our, I have to have all my slides vetted by legal. So of course, legal looked at this and they're like, Elizabeth, this adds up to more than 100%, 80, 20, 20. And I said, I know, it's a joke. Because usually what happens is you start with 100% and you'll get to some point, and like I said, you, you know, if you're doing well, you're gonna ask for more budget. If it's not, if, like I said, if it's like the craps thing where it's gone, it's gone. But there's another thing that t tends to happen at the end of the month, especially in e-commerce. If another channel starts to fail or another input isn't working out, I've seen a lot of, there's the fluidity of budgets, right? So bringing that budget over from another channel or another space. So maybe you had a display ad that you decided not to, or the media buy that you decided not to do. Uh, maybe one of the other search engines didn't do as well for you. Whatever it is, that money is, usually gets pretty fluid towards the end of the month. Bing, they also have multiple ad types, some scheduling. They're low maintenance, actually. So you can almost replicate everything that you do in Google on Bing. They very intentionally designed it that way because nobody wants to do all of this work for 10 to 20%, right? So what they did was they, they have what's called parity, and so they try and do almost all the same uh, types of features so that you can, for example, export in the offline editor your Google accounts and put them in to Bing. And they have excellent customer support. Every time I've tweeted at them, somebody's gotten back to me in 20 minutes. Uh, Facebook, audiences, this is really important. They're more audiences and search and behavior than they are search. That's what I would use Facebook for. They have a low cost per click on average. Uh, from all, all three of these, they are the lowest. But they can have high, ma high maintenance if ad fatigue. So that means that, you know, when you look, you know, Facebook, come on. It's all how we talk to grandma. So I'm not kidding. Like, that is how my 18-year-old cousin keeps my uh, great aunt from calling her, I think. She sells these crazy body wrap things, like by Mary Kay, and then she just posts things for grandma to like. So high maintenance, ad fatigue. So you've seen in the, the right-hand panel the sponsored, the sponsored ads, or sometimes they're in your news feed. And you notice how fast those change. Like you'll, 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 you'll scroll down your feed and you come back up and it might be a different ad. The inventory that it takes to run Facebook is pretty insane sometimes. The, the amount of images you need to have, the amount of text you need to have ready to go with those images. Uh, and then Facebook will kind of retire the ad for you. So it'll have a high peak, it'll go for a while, and then you'll notice that the impressions start to drop off. And that is because they are selectively, algorithmically, telling you it's time to move on. So that is, that is one drawback to Facebook. Uh, additional channels, so Pinterest, they actually have a free option still. It's feed-driven, rich pins. They have promoted and shoppable. They have limited program partners and limited cart partners. So I don't... I, both, I like them, but they're also not performance-wise as high as Google, Bing, and Facebook. Um, and they're a little more, I would say, difficult to follow sometimes because they create these programs on a per-vendor basis. So they have, for example, these shoppable um, pins, but it's only if you have Kenshu, right? So you have to have all these other pieces in order to get it to work. Uh, Connexity, this is a comparison shopping engine. If you might remember 1998, I believe that's when they came out. They are still alive. Uh, they become, it was Shopzilla, Price Grab, Shopzilla, Price Grabber, and Become all came together and they become the Connexity Network. Low CPCs, less ability to control though and optimize, but it's still traffic and I still have yet to see, and if you go on any of these sites, you can see there are major brands on there still today. And I have yet to still see a Target or a Macy's say, you know what? I don't want that extra 5% revenue. I don't want that extra, whatever it is. Those are still alive and people are still buying from them. And then LinkedIn, recognizing that obviously this is an e-commerce conference, but it's mostly B2B, lead gen, and then uh, high average CBCs. They're really proud of their stuff. Um, but now owned by Microsoft, and someday I hope to see what Microsoft does with them. Right now, nothing. So additionally, in your expectations category, competitors. So you need to know who your competitors are, whether or not they also view you as a competitor. I like to start with specific products, so to see where the, the overlap is, but also on the search terms. So what do people put in to find you, and what do you actually appear for? So you can use the Keyword Planner, which is in AdWords. Google Trends is a really cool one, so google.com slash trends. You can go in, put in uh, whatever your search query is, and it'll show you, I think it goes back as far as 2010, it'll show you that term search volume over time, and you can layer it in with other keywords, and then you can also change countries. So it gives you an idea of volume and what you might expect. So for fun, you could put in something like cilantro. Let's see, watch that go up and come down. Or uh, who's it, Chipotle, right? 
watch that come down. Or, you know, Furbies or Fitbits or whatever, and you can get kind of an idea of how, how folks search for things. And then it'll also do an overlay of a map to show you where in the country it's the hottest. So one of my favorite pictures that I actually didn't put in is, and I, I apologize, this is a text-heavy deck, and that is because I thought about developers like documentation, right? That's how it works? OK. Uh, I didn't have any flow charts, sorry. But I also thought about it and went, OK, if I put in screenshots of the UI, the problem is, is they're in the middle of a new UI. So half of the accounts have it and half of them don't. And I just thought about it, I was like, it's just going to be dated within like a week. And then you're going to open it. And you're going, I don't know what she was talking about. So again, things that were Googleable, I decided to not put in here. But one of the images that I have of a Google trend that I've been following is off the shoulder tops. Just, just out of curiosity, because I wanted to, to see how Google's doing it. Hot in New Jersey, very hot. <laughs> Bright purple. All right, we also have uh, keyword tools, right? So SpyFu, SimilarWeb, SEMrush. Now these are paid tools, but uh, SEMrush does have some free searches that you can run. They'll show, you, they'll show you a certain amount before they'll cut you off on the free stuff. And then compare personas, right? So your persona, versus your competitors, what your competitor's persona might be. What do you sell that they don't sell or they do sell, and where that might overlap. So are you after the families, and they're after you know, the, the dinks, you know, dual income, no kids? You know, where, where, where can you make that separation? And I did put in as much as I could in this presentation, so you can download it later, as many slides as possible with direct links to resources that I love. So, over 11 years, you, can, you tend to, to aggregate, and you tend to get a pretty good sense of who knows what they're doing. So getting started, if you really are that interested in doing paid search yourself, I do highly recommend the Google AdWords certification courses, because all the material's there. If you can get through the fundamentals section, you're in good shape. You're at the very least going to know the vocabulary. There's a search. And then after the fundamentals, there are advanced segments. There's search and shopping, depending on what you're doing. Shopping is focused on the product listing ads. Search follows all the stuff. They also have certifications in video, display, mobile, and analytics. But you don't need all those. I don't even have the certifications in all those. It's just too, it's too much. Uh, Market Motive is a good course to do. Linda and Udemy. And then what I did also is I put in this what I feel is one of the best explanations of quality score and how it works. Quality score is Google's reference number on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being poor, 10 being great. And that's in at a keyword level. That's visible at a keyword level. And it can be visible um, at the, I think it's the ad group level when it comes to product listing ads. There's also some other invisible quality scores that they have. So an account can have a quality score. They'll never tell you what it is, but it's there. Uh, and, but it's, it is how Google kind of gets an idea of where you sit on a scale for a relevancy for what the searcher put in, but also what you're offering in exchange. And then we also have product feeds. So there are some really good videos on YouTube about product feeds. You can literally just type in Google Shopping uh, optimization or best practices or tips, and you'll have all kinds of options. CPC Strategy has a really good ebook. I highly recommend. That's a cover to cover read. And then this one actually is mine, Fantastic Feeds and How to Mine Them. This is a presentation that I did in April of this year on feed management. So what you want to get out of your feed catalog, and I do have a couple of slides to go through on that as well, because that's actually kind of what I do at Commerce Hub. So we have in the demand side, we get the catalog from the customer, and then we take that catalog and we spin it out all the places that they want to be. So we map the categories, we map uh, attributes, and then we uh, apply basically a lot of content rules and filters to clean up stuff, because when it comes out, it is of varying uh, degrees of quality, shall we say. So I'm going to pause there for a second. Any questions on setting expectations, budgets? OK, I'm just going to keep going. You should write down questions as we go, right, so we get to the end. But here's the thing I also learned on the, at these things. If I send you to lunch two minutes early, I'm like your hero. So remember that when you fill out like speaker evaluations. All right. So let's talk about setting schedules and time management. So setting a schedule. So how much time do you actually have to dedicate to do this? So the fact of the matter is there are entire agencies and companies that do this as their livelihood, right? And then there's you know, people like me. Like the, I would spend 40 hours a week in accounts banging away at bids, creating campaigns, and ad groups, and writing text ads, and segmenting this, and analyzing that. You can, you can make a whole thing out of it, or maybe less, right? So at least twice a week, what I recommend on average, is you're probably going to be making bid adjustments. 
It is definitely not a set it and forget it kind of thing. We do know that bid frequency typically has an effect on performance, depending on the volume of traffic coming in across those keywords or those uh, product listing ads. So for example, on Black Friday last year, my guys were bidding every hour. So depending on how fast that's coming in and how many products you have and how much money you have to spend, as long as the, and the nice thing about Google is you're seeing the return numbers in almost, almost real time. They'll tell you there's a 15 at least minute lag before changes will take effect. But you can change within you know, 30 minutes a budget that was formerly $300 to $600 to capture whatever additional traffic. The other thing that we've noticed is uh, Thanksgiving. Black Friday is no longer relegated to Thanksgiving, right? Basically what has happened is Black Friday is now the entire weekend. And it is especially on Thanksgiving because no one wants to talk to their family anymore. They get out their phones and they start doing stuff, right? And a lot of times it's buying things or it's researching things or putting the cart for later, whatever. Uh, my guys now all work on Thanksgiving basically because we have to watch it. Um, one year somebody took down their entire site on Thanksgiving morning. I'm just going, what are you doing? We had another client that decided it was a good thing to do on Black Friday because I think he was bored. Um, he's like, I'm going to clean up the tags on this site. I'm going to clean up the tracking code. And we're like, that broke everything. Broke it all. I don't know why that guy wasn't fired. Um, anyway, <laughs> come on, you can't sell. What's, uh, but it also, like I said, depends on what you're working with. So, you know, it could be very, if it's very slow, you know, 100 clicks or so a day, maybe you don't need to bid that often. You're, you're in good shape. Um, I've had ones that have been as little maintenance as 15 minutes a week, where you just kind of go in and go, okay, we're good, we're good. This budget's where it is. I'm going to tweak this one. And then depending on uh, some of the tools I'll get into, maybe you'll be able to cut that down even further. And then weekly or monthly, look at campaign budget adjustments. So I usually just kind of do a, a trend. How, how fast, what's my budget velocity against how much I've spent across the month? Do I want to turn it up or turn it down? And then maybe one way to save money is just turn it off on some days. So Fridays usually suck, depending on, unless you're a DUI attorney. Um, Fridays usually you don't sell very much for, for various reasons. Um, I've had some clients that did extremely well on you know, Wednesdays. Uh, I look at when payday is, um, you know, and obviously it's different for everybody, but, you know, again, at the end of the month, you've got rent, possibly, uh, what other continuous bills might come up on that kind of cadence. Uh, I had one client where we figured out, this one was a hard one, is wedding invitations. And I figured out the time spiked from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. They were looking. It wasn't necessarily, there were some sales, but then it was, it was just mostly the traffic. And then the sales would spike from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So what they were doing was they were looking at their lunch times on their computers at these wedding invitations. If you've ever bought wedding invitations, which I hadn't, and it is a long process, um, they're going through the entire funnel. They're deciding on what paper they want the liner of the envelope to be. What color will the envelope be? What font will it be? What size will the font be? Will it say Mr. and Mrs. Present? Will it say, will it, what color will the ink be? Uh, is there a picture? Like, it's insane. I tried to check out once and it took me like an hour. I'm like, this is why they have to do it at home. So at six, so what I would do is change the bids so that from six to nine, we were present. Because what was happening is they'd perform the search, they'd do their research, they'd go home on a different device, perform the same search. So the downside on that one is, is was I'm losing the device, I'm losing the transition, right? Because there's, they're searching on a work machine, most likely, and they're buying on a home machine. Nowadays, we're getting much more advanced where Google can track you wherever you are, uh, whether or not that's on your mobile device simply through your Google account. So it is, the attribution is getting a lot easier. And then, uh, weekly, like I was saying, weekly or monthly, decide what you want your budget to be and make that flexible per the day of the week. And then set your schedule for account optimization. So this is just my laundry list. There's a lot you can search for online that probably has a similar or same or maybe have a couple variations. But you're probably going to want to review these things weekly or monthly. Now, if you're e-commerce focused, you're more likely going to do product listing ads, then you're going to do more keyword ads. More and more, what we're seeing is customers are changing their budgets. It used to be you would spend 70% of your budget on keywords and 30% on product listing ads. Now it's shifting. Now it's more like 30% on keywords and 70% on the product listing ads. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, and Google search results pages also favor that. So when you search for a product on Google and you see the product listing ads, it's either that carousel off the top because they want you to keep scrolling. They started adding designations like best reviewed or 
um, you know, top rated, that kind of thing, they're actually pushing the text ads further and further down. And then underneath all that, there's like the one SEO listing that they, that they leave in a good faith effort, right? Um, review quality score, so that's that number again, that one through 10, to see where you're at. If quality score is uh, typically pretty low and you're paying a pretty high CPC, I mean, that's the kind of action you might want to take is just cut the keyword. Uh, adjust ad copy, so always be testing benefits, features, and promotions. I always call it the less great, what is it, uh, great taste, less filling argument. So you got to have a couple of ads that speak to multiple benefits or features. Update site links, so in those few that you do have the text ads for. And then this is an important one, this click impression spend to gauge frequency. So like I was saying, if you only have a couple hundred clicks a month, you may not need to do this month or weekly. You could be going monthly. And uh, same with it help, to help you define what it is a high or low volume. So when I put this in, this 100 clicks or a million clicks, it's, it is all relative. I actually forgot a zero because I did part of this on the plane. And legal came back and they went, you're either, I think you're missing a zero. And I was like, yeah, that's what happens when you watch Kong Skull Island on the plane while you're doing this. Uh, that is a good movie. There are at least two Oscar winners in that, and they deserve another Oscar. It is. It's really good, actually. Um, but don't ha don't have high expectations. Um, account. Another thing on account optimization. So product listing ads. I like to say weekly or monthly. You can add the negative keywords. So you're reviewing your search terms and you're finding out whether or not people are putting in things, and then Google's showing your ads for things that you actually don't think you should be showing for. You want to organize your products. So this is a big one. You want to organize your products out of the gate in a very cohesive way. So like terms or like products. So campaign, product group level, you know, maybe you have your men's shirts in one campaign and your women's shirts in another. And then within those, that campaign for men's shirts, you have your product groups of you know, long sleeve, short sleeve, or plaid, or however you would like to divide your products so that you can better uh, bid on them effectively. And then review your modifiers. So I do have this a little bit more in here later. You can pull a lot of levers with Google. One of the things is, one of the things I would say with paid search is, there's a lot of crap you can do. It's overwhelming in some places. You can make a modifier on a mobile, they're not their mobile device, where they are in the country, the time of day, the day of week. It's a little, uh, it's a little overwhelming sometimes. To give you an idea, in 2006, um, I actually interviewed for the job of office manager at Portland, which is the small agency that I came from. And I didn't get the job. And I was like, well, screw those guys. I'm gonna go work at Starbucks corporate. It's gonna be fine. Then they called back and they said, hey, would you be interested in a pay-per-click manager role? I thought they said pay-per-clip. I didn't know what it was. I had to Google it. And it says, did you mean pay-per-click? I was like, yeah, probably. And then I clicked it and I read it and went, I'll figure this out. So I took the job. Zero experience. Took the job. The first day they said, here's a hammer. There's a stack of, box There's a stack of boxes. Build your desk. OK, build my desk. Here's here. And there was nothing that existed back then. And back then it was really simple, but today it is still We've added all these things, but it's still at its core. It's still really simple. You decide what it is that you'd like to appear for, and if somebody clicks on it, you pay. That is literally still how it works. So as, as daunting as, a, you know, you can go in and you start Googling things, and you're going to find 700 optimizations that you could make to your account. But really at the core, you, you just do the same things at work, and you, stay, and you still have to pay on a per-click basis. So, and then the other piece is review product data in the feed, right? So product titles, categories, description, and I'm gonna get more into this because I understand as an e-commerce, this is pretty important. So set schedule. This is, just, again, this is just an example I gave. I would recommend that if you decide to do this, you make your own schedule based on how, it is, how often you wanna review things. And then the other thing that I always say is put time on your calendar. Because if you start this and then you forget about it, and you tied your credit card to it, you're going to be very sad later. Because Google doesn't care if you forgot. You're paying for it. So they will charge you at different thresholds. You know, they'll be a 50, and then they'll let you go for a while, and then charge you 100, and, you know, but you can't forget. And don't put the intern in charge and be like, hey, you got this. Like, it's gonna be fine. So budget setting, review, frequency, ad copy, like all this, these are just the high level, and depending on what you ended up doing, maybe you don't even do keywords, right? So you won't even need this. But review and adjust, that's the biggest thing. Put it on your calendar, put time aside, don't move it, and don't dismiss the reminder. Otherwise, it will be a very expensive, ah, crap. 
Additionally, optimization tools. So keywords, you want the search query report, keyword planning tool in AdWords, those are free. Search suggests, this is one of my favorites, just go to Google and start typing something in, see what else comes up. Customer reviews is a great place I like to go and glean for what either people call things or how they use it, where they search for it. Uh, one of my favorites was a client who um, sold athletic uh, tape and supporters and all that kind of stuff, and he was telling me about, it's called, it's called pre-wrap. It's that spongy stuff that they put on and then they put the tape over it and then the, the, you put your shoe on or whatever. Um, but it's, it comes in many colors, but you know they use pre-wrap. His number one consumer of that product was not like you would think, like, uh, like an actual, like an athlete using it as pre-wrap with tape over it. It was teenage girls. Teenage girls love it. They bought it in all the colors. You know what I'm talking about. They take it, they cut it, they roll it up, and they make a headband. And it makes a nice, nice headband. It keeps their hair from sticking up. Uh, soccer, they do it all the time. Alex Morgan does it. There's the pink one. But how would you know that? How would you know people were using it that for unless you went and saw what customers were doing with it? And then your support team. If you have a customer support team, ask them. What is it that people ask for that you don't have? What is it they complain about? Um, what is it that breaks the most often that you might not want to sell anymore? That kind of thing. And the product ads, same, same actually applies for search success and customer reviews, but also that feed management piece. And so like I said, uh, we'll put more into that. These are some of my favorite higher level optimization resources. So easy eight step checklist, how to optimize shopping campaigns for level of intent, not actually products. Uh, and then Google shopping feed optimization. And this one's a fascinating one. Like I said, this is a higher level. Is price a proxy for quality score? So whether or not, how you set your price, how successful you might be in the Google auction. Because Google does take into consideration when they're serving up those search results, price. Now, it doesn't, you don't have to be the lowest price. It's not like a marketplace. If you do a product listing ad search, if you do a Google Shopping search, and you'll see in there, it'll say, you know, from these five stores, you'll have one, and it'll have, you know, $13.99, and then there'll be some others, and they might be even cheaper. But for some reason, Target's beating out those other four, even though they're 50 cents more. Why is that, right? It has to do with that relevancy. It has to do with the fact that Target is a trusted store. They know that when you click there, the product's going to be there. It's more likely to have in stock. Maybe there's a shipping option that they're taking into consideration. Google doesn't tell us everything that's in their um, secret sauce of quality score. We know some things. Uh, I know later today, like Rand Fish is going to speak on SEO. I don't know if any of you got to hear Rand speak before. It's awesome. You're going to want to see that. But you know, one of the things that we know about the Google search algorithm is there's about 300 or so factors that we know. How much don't we know? How much have they stopped using? And it, it's a very similar to paid search. It's a different algorithm, but it's still a lot of the same things apply. OK, so setting up for success. So tracking and automation. This is an important thing, right? So you not only are tracking what your bids are, how much money you've made, but you may want to know some other things. So Google Analytics, I'm pretty sure, is a very familiar word in this room. Um, it is literally the best free analytics tool, unless somebody's got a better one that's free. I don't know. I mean, they made this product so you would spend more money on AdWords. AdWords was an $80 billion product last year. Facebook was $26 billion, and Amazon was $1.6, to give you an idea of like scale. Yeah, it's just billions. Jeff Bezos just found out his couch. He's fine. Um, but you can do dashboards, schedule reports. Bid management software, this is what I was talking about earlier about you, where you may be able to save some time. If you're an enterprise, you got to have bid management software. If other, or you have to have like a herd of interns, and I don't recommend that. Um, but the time and the scale that it will take to manage uh, a million keywords, you need an enterprise solution. I would probably cut it off. If you only have 1,000 keywords, you don't need a bid management solution. Uh, if you have 100,000, probably. Uh, I would. And then these are just a few of the, the, the bid management solutions that are out there. There are many. There are many of varying degrees of quality and scale, and they'll charge you all differently. Number one thing to know about these guys, their first price that they give you, don't take it. Go back and like, I don't know, Quizio said they'd give it to me for 2%, and then see what happens. <clears throat> just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, Quantic Mind's a good one. That one's, so what's interesting too is some of these were, are older than others. So like uh, Marin is older 
than, say, Quantic Mind, which was built in 2012. So depending on the tech stack that they're built on may influence their functionality on how fast they can roll out new things. Quantic Mind, I know, for example, in their bidding algorithm has 12 different inputs, including weather and stock price. So that's not everybody. So ask, ask our, if you're gonna ask for bid management, ask higher level questions like that. WordStream is really good for small businesses. They also have some uh, services piece too. So I, they're, and they're based out of Austin. And then interns. Believe it or not, I actually ran a small business program with interns, charge 300 bucks a month, get folks to, you know, my, my target client was Steve the plumber, literally. I named it after my first client, Steve. He was a plumber. Uh, and he, he was a guy, he's busy, right? He's busy plumbing and, and doing things like that. So he needed leads. So we created a paid search program that's pretty simple. We could update it within 30 minutes every week. He gave us a, you know, a few hundred bucks a month. We brought him leads. I mean, you can, like I said, you can make it as simple as that. So feed management. So this is probably the thing most folks are more interested in. So I put this together. These are my recommended guidelines uh, for what I've seen in the last few years as far as size goes. So you can manage your feed catalog through a Google spreadsheet. Like I said, one of the clients that I had was two products. That was the smallest one I ever did. That was in a Google spreadsheet. I had one client that had this demand where nightmare of a system couldn't even get a product feed out. It didn't make sense, but it, it was what it was. So we would go into Google Analytics, we'd pull the last six months of data, and we'd sort the products by revenue. And we took the top 100 generating revenue products, and I gave it to an intern, and I said, here's a Google spreadsheet. I need you to fill in all 20 attributes. And in order to find the SKU number, you had to add it to a cart, and then look at the cart and get the SKU number. Yeah, that took a couple weeks. But they used that product feed for like a year and a half. So there are ways to, to hack it together. But if you're small, you can do it. Like, you don't necessarily need like, a feed management solution uh, or a special plugin to get the category out. Uh, sorry, the catalog out. Excel, you can still do it this way if you really wanted to. You can manually upload. Every 30 days, it expires. You've got to do another upload. I don't really recommend the 30-day thing. You've got to do fresh product data. It's also a signal to Google that says that you are actively doing things and you're giving it new information. The other thing to remember about product data is it's really important, actually, when it, comes to, when it comes to Google. Otherwise, how does Google know what the thing is? If your product title is two words, tell me one product that you can accurately describe that everyone's like, oh, yeah, I got that, in two words. You can't even do Apple iPhone. Which Apple iPhone, right? Is it white or is it black? How much space does it have? Like, as consumers, we expect more information from our searches. Two words won't do it. And then tool provider. So this is kind of like what I do, which is the big ones. So static or constantly rotating inventory. If you're a flash sale site, you probably need something a little bit more robust, right? Fast changing inventory, lots of prices and promotions. If you have additional um, relationships with retailers or uh, what first party relationships, right? So let's say Walmart buy, has five of your SKUs and you have another 30, you can't sell those five you know, for less than they're on walmart.com, right? They get very upset. So, and then the other piece is like they were saying, that poor product quality information. So if you don't have the right information, it doesn't list well. I mean, you see some of the things on Amazon, right? Where you, you search for it and you scroll down, and you're like, that's not what that is. Or it's got a title that's like 40 words. Check any electronic thing, like just like a car charger or something, and you'll get these insane, uh, descriptions, but you got to clean that kind of stuff up because it's good for searchers, but it's also good for the search engines so they can actually tell what the thing is. So how do you tell whether or not you can do it by yourself? So one of the things is obviously size of account and whether or not you're staying on top of the industry, just a little bit. You don't have to go all the, you don't have to go all the way in. You don't have to, to, to be an expert, but you have to know what the new fun features and functions are and what they've deprecated. So whenever, so I belong to like the Google, inside Google AdWords. So they'll email you with a newsletter every time they add something or they take something away. But they do that, you always gotta go, why'd they do it? What are they up to? What is, what is Google doing now? So then that's when you go to the industry blogs to find out what it means. Because Google will tell you how great it is, but they won't necessarily tell you if, if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, if you have a Google or Bing rep assigned, then you definitely are in a good, you're in a better space than most people. 
And then if you have development help. So I recommended that, I, I think it's a case of whiskey that you should have at your desk at various times to bribe developers to get them to do what you need. And then if you need an agency or a consultant. So it depends on the size of the account and the number of accounts. If you have more accounts because you have more brands or more sites, you might need some help. Uh, if the time to manage exceeds 20 hours a week, it's probably pretty good. If you don't have somebody in-house dedicated to doing it at that level, that's when you might want to seek some help. And like I was saying, if you're running multiple programs. So if you personally are also running the email campaigns and are also running marketplaces and you're also, I don't know, in charge of the bagel club, you might look at some help. And then setting up for success. So one of the things I always say is you got to test stuff, right? So 80% of consistent revenue tends to come from 20% of the products. And I think it's pretty true across a lot of uh, verticals. Just make sure that you're funding your best consistently. And then consider setting aside just a little bit of money to play with. So it's like craps within craps. It's very meta. But you, you're going to look at it and you go, OK, we're going to test this new ad type. We're going to test uh, this new. Uh, feature, we're going to test um, what would happen if I threw more money at the problem, right? That's, that counts too. And then success for the next level. So this are, these are my favorite next level resources. So remarketing. You can do a lot with remarketing today. And here's the thing. If you have a really small budget and you're finding that Google, just the PLA or the search ad, or the text ads aren't worth it, just do the remarketing piece. Because the remarketing is a lot cheaper. And it's a much more engaged and cust engaged customer, and you can utilize other sources that have, other referral sources. So you can use the remarketing feature in AdWords to remarket to people that came to your site via email, direct, organic listing, social post, whatever. And you can divide them up by their behaviors, whether or not they spent 30 seconds on a page, did they add something to a cart? One of my favorite pieces, it's actually in my presentation, your retarding sucks, but it doesn't have to. I actually didn't name that. It's a good name, but I didn't name it. Um, Segment your cart abandoners by how much they abandoned. So somebody who abandons 10 bucks is not necessarily as valuable as someone who abandoned $100. Uh, and then the complete AdWords audit to part 15, part 15 audiences. This is an insane blog post. It's, it's going to take you like an hour to read. But it has everything you could ever want to know about audiences and segmenting for remarketing. One place. Um, and then dynamic product ads. So these basically print money. Uh, I, I have yet to see an ad type that is successful. Now, yes, it is a remarketing method because they've already interacted or seen your product in some way. But when it comes to Facebook, the returns on average are like 1,200 and 1,500%. It's insane. So Ad Espresso has a really good setup on how to get started on those. So if you're going to do Facebook advertising and you don't have the time to do all the, the text ads and the, key, and the, uh, the uh, pictures, do the dynamic product ads. All you need is a product catalog. Uh, additional bid modifiers, so like I said, I tried to stay out of things that were Googleable. So these are just a list, and this is a good place to go and see what the latest are, because they like to add and subtract them. Same with display, video. You can go to the Google Display Network. You can do YouTube. YouTube has shoppable video ads. I have yet to see those really go anywhere. They're kind of, some people, you know, it's like any ad in YouTube, it's kind of like over, over time, we've got this habit now that when they come up, we go, nah. Like you just, you just want to nah. And then customer match, which is what I was talking about with um, Gmail, whether or not uh, you can upload your first party data and target people that have already interacted with you in some way. And then last but not least, the list of all the resources. So search engine land, it's all the news, the new tips, features, PPC chat. If you really want to get nerdy and you want to, or you want to read what other PPC nerds say, this is where you go. PPC hero is more of an agency focus, but you could actually see how agencies talk about paid search. And then Clicks Marketing, I like their news and views because it's curated by paid search people. So you know, between these three sources, you could have 80 stories that come up. These guys curate it down to five. And I like their five. So it's a lot easier. OK, I have just a couple. I have five minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Yep. So they think they got eight conversions, but they might have got one actual lead. No, it's BS. So <laughs> it's BS. The problem is, is on uh, Google has a struggle right now between making that making AdWords in the platform self-service and approachable, right? 
but at the same time, it can be incredibly complex. So they miss things like that and explain. It's, it's like they don't go in and use their own product sometimes and understand how it comes from, how, how, how as, a, as an advertiser, you would go in and drill on that. Now, to be fair, Google gives an incredible amount of data and information. The fact that you even know that, right? Amazon wouldn't even tell you that. Amazon would make you be like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's a limitation of the platform. So, um, and Facebook just a little bit, but don't repeat those because, you know, yeah, we'll have to strike that later. But uh, <laughs> from a public traded company, it's supposed to be nice. Um, but yes, that is, you're absolutely right. Uh, a lot of times what happens is enough people complain about a feature like that that they do eventually fix it. So you have to complain to the right places. And that could be in a Google forum because they do have Google employees that um, monitor those help center questions. So you could post it in there. They do track that, and they do kind of you know start to get the tally on what what is uh, misleading versus what the actual is. But yes, you're right. It's BS. Yes, sir. A little bit. So so they're the most recent. Amazing, I guess, uh, I don't know if amazing is the right word, but the connection with Walmart. That one is terrifying in a, in a it's everybody versus Amazon way, right? So now also Target has partnered with Google Home. So what they don't have today for Google Home that I'm waiting to see is Google Express is basically what it's stacked on for um, the delivery piece, right? So if you wanted to order through your Google Home, yeah, you can order from whatever, but Google Express, I don't know if you're familiar with the program, but it's basically Google's marketplace. So they now have, it's like, a, depending on the store, $25 or $35 minimum delivery. They've taken away the membership fee. They're expanding it. There's a lot of retailers in it. And it used to be, you can only be brick and mortar retailer with a physical location. Now they're letting uh, retailers do it that don't have physical locations, like Wayfair. Um, so as long as you can fulfill it, they'll let you sell it. And they just uh, struck a partnership with Walmart. So Walmart is now selling hundreds of thousands of products through Google Express. And you can link your Google account to your Walmart account and forever reorder through Google Home. And what I'm waiting to see is, and this is an interesting piece, is the orders API that the purchases on Google and the Google Express um, products sit on to, to process the orders um, are the same. So you have to do purchases on Google, or I mean uh, AdWords in order to get to Google Express. But there's no ads yet on Google Express, like that product listing ads. I think it's coming. It makes a lot of sense. Why wouldn't you monetize that space? That's what Google does. They're the, they're the uh, advertising platform that has a search engine. So it's, it'll be really interesting because now they're into the order management piece of the business. Does that make sense? It kind of went all over the place, but they're doing some stuff. Oh, so I'll tweet it out, but also um, I believe, I mean, the conference organizers have it, and I think they might send out something afterwards too, but I'll definitely tweet them out. Yeah, so they're different networks, technically. So ad roll contracts with different publishers versus then, um, say, say, then Google does. There is some overlap. They'll never expose to you what that list is, so you'll never know that. Uh, ad roll tends to be cheaper in a volume standpoint. Uh, the one that I'm really interested in actually is uh, Critio, and they're because they acquired Hook Logic, and Hook Logic has a um, almost their own retargeting search partner network on retailer sites. So if you go to Sears and there's a banner across the top and it tells you and it starts showing you the Samsung fridge that you saw somewhere else, it's because they're retargeting you on Sears. So they're actually figuring out how to build retargeting networks without Google. Yes, sir. So buy some cheap social clicks. That's a good one. So you got you got you have to create the demand somewhere, right? So either Ellen has to promote it, or you, yeah, really easy, right? Or you have to create the demand somewhere else. And it could be on a social channel. It could be uh, through an email marketing campaign. That's usually the best way to, to, to pump up a remarketing pool. Or you could do a display ads by um, and just target very specific sites. And you know you got to have a reason, right? So why are they coming to the site to fill that pool? So it's got to be an offer. It's got to be an exclusive. Or like literally, Ellen's got to be on your site. Anything else? I'm going to hang around. I'll be here. And then I'll also be at lunch. And 
I am more than happy to answer individual questions of, hey, so-and-so, or I saw this, because I recognize that not everybody wants to say it to a room of 40 people. What's your Twitter handle? EB Kendo, actually. I think I have it at the beginning. So if we go to the beginning, I'll grab it. And Kendo is not a paid search term. It is a Japanese martial art. That I do. And I am a fifth degree black belt. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good